Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, January 16th. Today's topic is Moodle 2, What Can It Do? Our special guest today is Tammy Moore, one of our show hosts. Also, our hosting the show, Peggy George, and I'm Lori Moffitt. Thank you to Patty Ruffing for doing the recording for us today, since Tammy usually does the recording. I think I could introduce Tammy. Um, I've actually known Tammy for as long as I've been teaching online, and she got me started. Oh, Peggy, you're going to introduce Tammy. <laughs> okay. Yes, but but it is fine for you to share what you know about Tammy, and I'll jump in after you. Go right ahead. Okay. Thank you, Peggy. I was investigating online classrooms at the time and ran across uh, Illuminate trainings that Tammy was running, and attended those that particular summer. This is the predecessor to Blackboard Collaborate. And I was so interested in what Illuminate could do that I started watching some of Tammy's uh, online biology courses at the time and began to learn a lot more about Illuminate and then started volunteering for virtual homeschool group and have done so ever since. So I learned about Moodle at the same time I was learning about Illuminate. And I'm going to take that pause as my cue to jump in and continue this introduction for Tammy. Moodle is a topic that's come up fairly frequently in our surveys with our participants wanting to learn more about it. And that's why we're so thrilled to have our very own Tammy Moore here as our special guest presenter, and especially to be sharing and demonstrating some of the newest features of Moodle 2.9. Tammy is always behind the scenes in our shows, providing the closed captioning as for each week. So Many of you may not even realize she's with us, but she is always there, and she is amazing. Tammy is one of the most competent, generous, kind, hardworking, sharing people I have ever known. If you follow her virtual homeschool group on Facebook, you will see how she constantly provides support and information to help all of her parents and teachers in the courses. She truly is multi-talented. She is an artist, a teacher, a mom, a volunteer for online courses using Illumini, Moodle, VoiceThread, CMAP, and Adobe eLearning Suite with her virtual homeschool group. She's a, an 11-year-long Moodler and administrator of the virtual homeschool group, which is what she'll be telling us more about in her presentation. You also will love checking out her personal website in our live binder today to see some of her amazing artwork under the tab Creative Arts. Browse through that later. She has some fantastic watercolor and pencil drawings there that look like they're photographs. They are so good. Tammy has been the spearhead of the online course cooperative that brings together parents who are homeschooling and teachers in a free online course. Her project uses Moodle as her LMS and Blackboard Collaborate for their live online classroom. There are not a lot of turnkey curriculum specifically for online courses, and the budget is very tight, as you can imagine, for a donation-based volunteer-run project. So Tools for Building eLearning Resources has really been a big part of her project from the beginning. That's why it's such a rich experience. 
So thank you so much, Tammy, for sharing your expertise with us today. And I'm going to advance to our newbie question, just in case there's anyone who has any confusion about what exactly is a learning management system, and ask you to answer that and take over with your presentation. Tammy's been temporarily knocked out of the classroom. She ought to be back shortly. Oops. There are just some days like that. I'm so sorry, but I'm sure she'll be right back. She has power in her system there unless her internet goes down because she is in a somewhat rural area. So we'll keep an eye out, and I'm sure she'll be right back in. While we're waiting for her, why don't you take a look at the Live Binder and uh, click on that tab for her personal website. And the Live Binder link, in case you missed it, is right there. And um, the tab for the um, for her personal website says, let's see. Um, have to find it. But go ahead and browse through the live binder while we wait for Tammy. And Paula, thank you for trying to answer the question that Tammy's about to answer. Um, I'm back. Sorry. Murphy was right on cue <laughs> of Murphy's Law. All right. Can everyone hear me? Sorry about getting dropped right there. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> Okay, great. Sorry about that. Hey, you know, if, if Murphy, it's got to be Murphy because what's the most perfect moment to get dropped? It's right after you've been introduced. Okay, so we are, I, I'm assuming we're to the point where it's already been asked, what is learning management system? Well, we saw from the, the polling questions that the vast majority of you have already been working with learning management systems. Just a couple hadn't worked with them before. So for those that haven't worked with them before, Learning management systems is basically a just full suite of tools for you to be able to have your courses online. Now, that, as far as what we're talking about with Moodle and those of that same class, it's not so much like an online classroom here, but it's more of a platform where you can post quizzes, the scores go to the gradebook. There are tools for creating the content. There's tools for grading students' knowledge of the content. And just a huge suite, quizzes, assignment uploaders, and really, now that so many classrooms are moving online, it's just a matter of, well, what would I need to do that? That's what a learning management system is. What would you need in order to, to work with your students? So some of us that use learning management systems are full-time. We don't even mix the face-to-face. -face. It's just everything's online. And then other, others of us that use it, it's a blend. So we'll have face-to-face, -face, a whole classroom right there where we can see our students. Um, and then this would be an accompaniment to it. So today I'm going to specifically talk about Moodle. And Moodle's been around for a long, long, long time. Um, I know we've been using it for 11 years. And it was going before we got started. So uh, and I think Blackboard is another long time one. There's a lot of new ones that have popped up in the last about three years. So there's Canvas, there's, oh, I'm sure a lot of you that are using some of the other LMSs can pop in some, some of the names of those that are out there that are available. Some of them free, some of them not free. And Moodle is a little different than most of the others in that it's open source, which means that you can actually go in and see the code. And that's part of why it's still very, very popular, because there are times when universities or school districts, they want to have some sort of customization that goes beyond what's built into it. Well, they can actually see the code of how it's built, and then they can create their own customizations to it all the way down to the code level. And it's also modular, and that's nice because it's easy for people who would like to create plugins 
to create plugins. And that allows us to be able to go above and beyond what the core programmers that, that do most of the bulk of the work, but allows us to have all kinds of things that plug into it. So even if you've got somebody who's made a plugin, you go, oh, you know, I'd like this little tweak to it. Well, even if they say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just too busy, I can't quite do that tweak for you, you could even, you know, hire a programmer for a couple of hours and say, could you do this little tweak? And voila, you've got it. So that's one of the wonderful things of having that code exposed so that it can be made into anything that people want to have it made into. Yeah, the M in Moodle is modular, so, so they even from the very foundations, they were looking at that being modular to make it easy for a whole community to come together. Another thing that I really like about Moodle as an LMS is because they do have active development, they do have an active community. And that's good considering how, how long it's been around to still have such an active community. Uh, this week, for instance, um, on the server side of things, because we, I actually do the server hosting, had some questions, posted on the community, I had answers within an hour or two. So I love that kind of an active community. So especially if you're fairly new, or if you just weigh in on the deep end like I am, I'm all the way to the server administration side too. And I'm not a professional server admin, so it's nice to have all these people of all these different experience levels that you can say, um, I'm stuck here. I've tried everything I know to do. Can you help me out? And, and you get help within a couple hours from all these other people that are also using Moodle. So that's, that's really what's kept me hooked into it. Um, we started out, I think, Moodle 1.6 11 years ago on shared hosting. And then gradually, well, not so gradually, the first year we outgrew it. We grew really quickly. Um, and then moved to uh, VPS. And then we moved up to 1.9, pretty close to that time. And we were at 1.9 for a long, long time. This year, this last summer, we moved to 2.9. And that's because it, it had some features I want to tell you about that just hooked me. I said, OK, I've got to have that. So from what, from what I've seen from the different people talking that have used Moodle, a lot of you are at different, different locations as far as what version, if you are using it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what hooked me into going ahead and switching over and moving on up there to Moodle 2.9. All right, so let's go ahead. At this point, uh, I get to take control and drive these slides. So I'll take us forward to our first one. So what I'm going to do is I am going to let you actually explore a course hands-on. So when you go to the website, we'll post the link in just a moment. I'm going to pop this up here on the screen. Yeah, as soon as everyone can see this, I'm going to pop it up in the corner just to make it a little easier. Once I post the link to the site, what I want you to do is down near the bottom, there are all sorts of courses that are listed. And they have various access levels. We call these GLAM, uh, little GLAM icons. So it tells families what type of course it is. The G is guest access. The L is it's a live online class that's run and collaborate. A is that it's mostly running just out of that Moodle. And it's and at your own pace. And then we have some MOOCs that we do. For you to get to go in and actually see a course without having to enroll, you're going to look for the courses with the G on it. So I've made several of our science courses available. So now let me go ahead and get you the link so you can get there. All right, so click that link, and that's our project. And that project's been running for about 11 years. And so we are moving, we've moved to a new web server. And now we're on 2.9. We also have another web server that's 1.9. So if you go looking for us through a web search, you're just as likely to find our .com site as our .org. Our .org is our, our 2.9. Our .com is our 1.9 Moodle course, Moodle site. All right, so by now you're probably there. And you can go ahead, if you want to, and click on any of the courses that have guest access. There's a code when you click it. If you look up near the top of the course description, it tells you what the guest access code is. Just enter that into the little entry box at the bottom, and I'll let you go right into a course so you can take a look at it. All right, now, what I want you to explore, whether you're on the home page or whether you actually go into a course page, 
is how mobile friendly the new Moodle 2.9 is, and especially this particular theme that we've chosen. This one's called the BCU theme. And that's because it was developed by a uh, university that has a U at the end. Now, what I want you to do if you are on a desktop or a laptop, grab the right edge of your browser and make your browser thinner. When you make your browser thinner, you'll see that it will reshuffle. And you can get an idea of how this is very mobile friendly. Depending on whatever size your screen is, things adjust and reshuffle so that small screen sizes are able to really have a nice, pleasant experience on the Moodle. And so that's something that's relatively new um, because Moodle switched over to being able to use a bootstrap theme. And that allows those people who like to make themes to use bootstraps. And bootstraps is excellent for being able to reshuffle and make it pleasant for all different screen sizes. Yeah, exactly, responsive design. So that was one of the hooks that we had that really encouraged us to go ahead and move to 2.9 because we were starting to have a large, large number of families that were using mobile devices to get into the website. All right, now let's go ahead then, whether you're in a course or not, I've got slides because I know some of you probably would prefer just to watch the slides instead of go to the link. And even if you're inside of a course page, guest access lets you see resources but it doesn't always let, it doesn't let you to do anything that's graded. So I'm going to want to show you some of the graded types of things. So going forward. All right, so I'm going to introduce you mostly to the quiz tool in 2.9 because that's the other thing that really was the hook in this fish's mouth to move to, to the 2.9 version because there's a new question behavior. And we've really taken advantage of that new question behavior. And the new question behavior allows students to, re, to, to hit a redo button, get another question to replace the one that they currently have. So I'm going to show you how we've put that tool to use. And even if you're using 2.9, I think you'll find some of these tips to be useful. And if, you're not even, if you've never even used Moodle, you'll get a good sense of what you could do with it. OK, so I've got a little screenshot that I took from my chemistry course page. And this is just basically the top of one particular block. It's for module one. And for lecture one, these are the resources that you're going to have. The Play Now button is linking out to the resource that I created with Captivate. I don't know if we have any Captivate fans in here. But if you do want to explore, well, what is a Captivate one like? You can go ahead and click on that uh, a little bit later and explore it. We also have a mix in there with VoiceThread. So that's been an old standby, been around for a very, very long time. Some of you might be familiar with that. So we, we have a little bit of a blend of both. We're gradually replacing our VoiceThreads with Captivate. And then we also have links out to notes, and we have links out to concept maps. Now, these parts right here, these are mostly, I want to point out that you can integrate all kinds of resources that are out there that you're using on the internet. So concept maps is outside of our Moodle, but we can easily link to it. And what I've done is I've just, using the little editor that they've got, brought in an image that I want to have and then just add the link to it so that students could click it to go straight to the concept maps. Notes, a little bit of a blend there. Sometimes we're linking out to PDFs, and sometimes we're linking to Google Docs, and sometimes we're linking to HTML pages. So it just depends on what you need. But my point with these is that you can link out to resources. You can also embed the resources inside of your Moodle. So if you've got a video that you want to have, you can actually host the video right there on your Moodle or link out to it. Captivate's not free. I've, I've done a, um, I think it's been about a year, uh, I've done a presentation on Captivate, but I highly recommend it if you really love to make interactive lessons, more than just sit back and watch types of videos, but you can build drag and drop activities. You can, it's, it's, it's very powerful. You can create as nice a lesson as people could do with Flash. So it's very, very powerful, yet very, it's very learnable. What you don't have to do, you don't have to do a lot of coding. You have to learn how to code in ActionScript, for instance. Very, very approachable. 
So if you if you have more questions about Captivate, that's another one of my absolute big time passions. So contact me. I'll give us some contact information a little bit toward the end, and I would love to talk Captivate with you too. All right, and then this part that's right up here, this is actually one of the tools built into Moodle. And our theme, it, the, the icon that's put in front looks like this. And depending on the theme, yours might look a little different. But in our theme, everything that has that little check mark is, is a quiz. And that's what I wanted to introduce you to, is a quiz tool. Now, what our goals are for with our quizzes is that we want to bring the bulldog out in our students. We don't use our quizzes just, OK, go in, answer this, and it's done and over with. Your grade's going to go to the grade book, and that's it. We want that quiz tool to, to provide the students with tools to use it as a learning tool, not just a quizzing tool. And that's what we're going to talk about a good bit in the presentation. Going to the next page. Once you click to go into the quiz, you can, if you want to, you can actually embed the resources right inside the quiz. I like this because I teach classes live online in a in an environment just like what you got here. We use Collaborate. When I post the link for my students to go in to take the quiz, I like having these things right there for them to click if they need to. So if they want to go and review the concept map and the notes before they start their quiz, they can. Now, uh, you can set it so that your quizzes are one take only if you want it like an exam. Or you can use it as a tool for them to study by setting it to highest grade. And they can just keep retaking it and retaking it and retaking it as many times as you want to. There are multiple attempts. We'll show right down here. And it'll show whether the attempt is complete or if it's an in progress, what their marks are. And they can click to go in and review it if they want to. And then as you see here, the continue last attempt. So we're going to go forward. You're going to get a little view. Now, these are custom-made slides just so that I could do this without app share, since I know sometimes that's hard on bandwidth. All right, so this is the, what the quizzes look like in Moodle 2.9. You have a navigation system over here that shows all the questions that are in the quiz. When the student gets it wrong, it will indicate it's wrong by giving it a, it, you can submit them one at a time, as a matter of fact. You don't have to wait until the, all of your questions are in, submit at the end. If the teacher sets it up, they can actually check their questions right there. I love that because students get instant feedback. And they don't have to wait until the end of the quiz. They can do it question by question. And that's the way I like to set mine up. So that's why you're going to see this color code even as we go through. So if they get it wrong, it would be red. And if they get it partially correct, it's color coded yellow. And if they get the answer correct, it's color coded green. They can also click and jump right here to the questions. The eyes are information boxes. You can use information boxes for labeling, well, what kind of skills will the next set of questions be covering for objectives. We do that a lot in our math courses where we identify what are the next sets of questions going to be working on. You might have scenarios that the next few questions are going to be based on. You might have charts, graphs, equations, those kinds of things that you want to make available. And you can put those in the information boxes. So I like that. That's a feature that wasn't available in 1.9. Now, let's say that the student is going in here. And of course, I've made it really obvious, right and wrong answers. I hope you can. You, you probably understand that, yeah, you would put a real question here and a real quiz and real right and wrong answers here. But once they make their selection, then they would click the checkbox to see if it's correct. Now, I am wanting to show you what you can do with the redo button and hint levels. So notice that right here by question one, it says tries remaining three. And that's because one of the ways we really have found works excellent is to set it up with two hint levels. And then it gives the redo button. So oh, I also want to mention you can do page breaks if you want to. And within the breaks, you can even select one section to randomize the question. And the next section that you break it up into, you can set it to not randomize. So it's very customizable. All right, now let's go on to what it would look like when you hit the first hint level. So let's say the student selected this and it's the wrong answer. Their numbers is going to drop down. It won't look like that. I'll actually just replace the three with the two. But I thought that would make it more obvious there. So now they're down to two hint levels. 
they can get whatever specific feedback you want for that wrong answer. And we try to choose wrong answers that the student would make if they had some sort of a conceptual problem. So they're going to be common wrong answers. And it's nice because you can get very specific feedback. It's like sitting right beside them as a tutor, but it's all done by the computer. All right, and then the hint level that would show if they get it wrong, what we do is we set it where they lose 50% of their points if they get it wrong the first time. We provide them with contact information on how to get help. So for instance, open office hours, they would click the little globe. It would remind them what the open office hours are, contact information for teacher. Um, and sometimes it's even, sometimes I even monitor it and can catch it live time where if they go in there and they click and they go in, I can actually see they need help live time. I can actually interact with them through the messaging system right there. Then if we've got a walkthrough for that question and all the science questions that are, are, are now completely with walkthrough at Hint2, we're working on converting over our math courses to that. But in uh, walkthrough on Hint2, that's our little indicator that if they miss it again and they go to Hint2, that there will be a solution there on how to solve that one. So let's go forward, see what hint two is going to be like. All right, now at this step, they will have lost all their points. And you could probably see how important it is to set it up that way, because if they knew they could get to a walkthrough without losing all their points, they would just enter the answer in <laughs> and then just cheat. Um, but what, what this one is, they've lost all their points, but they can see a solution. Now, we've used images of, you know, just your works it out, gets a screenshot, and then puts it in so they can see the teacher's handwritten working it out. Um, we can also post links to videos. We can embed videos. Whatever support you want to put in there, you could even do a captivate in which they have to step through. They have to put what they think the answer is at the next step, get feedback, and then put the next answer in at that step and give lots and lots of customized information. So if you use Captivate, that's a great place to put it in. So here they are. They've lost all their points, but they've studied how to solve it. And now they're going to click Try Again. Remember, their points are completely gone at this point. Now here's where the redo, oh, oh, let me go ahead and do the flag. I forgot I've got this one next. There's also in Moodle 2.9 the ability for the student to flag that question. All they have to do is just click on it. It toggles it between off and on. And it flags it over here in the, the uh, navigation system. It's smaller than this. I'm a little, I, I think if I were to tweak anything, it would definitely be to make the flag a little bigger. That's about the size I would want it to be, but it is about maybe a half of that. So it's a little smaller. But that allows the students to, be, to flag it for them to come back to, to flag it so later they can contact the teacher and say, I have questions about this one. Could you check on this one? I think maybe the question's wrong. And so it's easy to flag or if they sit down with their parents and they're not sure about something, they want their parents to explain something to them. You know, they can flag it so they can remember what one it was that they needed some help with. Now at this point, they do get a try again button after that hint to. Then after they hit that, they get the redo button. So that's going to be over here to the left, and they've, they've used up all their hint levels. When they hit the redo question, if you've designed your question pools and pools, they can actually hit the redo button, get another problem fresh, different than the one that they've been working on, but the same type. And that's probably been our biggest job with converting to Moodle 2.9 because we love this feature. We love it that the student can can learn from one that they missed, say, aha, and the light bulb goes off, and they realize, oh, that's, that's what I'm doing wrong. Hit the redo button in that very same quiz attempt, get a whole new question of the same type, and then they could take what they learned from that one and apply it to the next one. So we love that because it is, it's, it's almost as good as having a tutor sitting right there beside them because they have hints specific to their, to their answers that they give. They have full solution walkthroughs, but then they can redo and take it. I love that. And that's why we said, OK, OK, hooked. Let's, let's go. We're going to go to Moodle 2.9. But you do have to set up your question pools as a teacher 
so that whenever they click the redo button, they're going to get another one of the same type. And that's been our biggest job so far with converting over, because we need to go into all of our questions and rearrange them so that we've got these question pools. If you've been using Moodle and you've already got them set up in question pools, well, you're set to go. And you're ready to, ready to go without having to do all the work we're doing and shuffling our questions around into these question pools. So that's the work on the teacher side is those question pools. All right, now, going forward, once they get all the way through all the navigation, the very last page is this one. I like the way they set this up because it reminds them that they may still have hint levels left. So a lot of times a student will just breeze through. They, won't have, they wouldn't have taken the advantage of the fact that they can get all the way down to the hint too. So if they got it correct, that's okay. They, you know, it'll tell them you got it correct. It'll show what the mark is. Or if they if they submitted it, it shows what the points are. But I love that they take the time to show that there's still some tries left. And I really fuss at my students whenever I go in and I take a look and they haven't used up all their tries. They they get a they get a Miss Tammy fuss. So I want them to not be lazy. I want them to go all the way through so they can see how do you solve what you don't know how to do. So you can learn from it. So I like that they've got that in there. And they can at this point easily go back in. They could use this over here to navigate back, or they can use this to go right back to the attempt. If they have used up all their tries, they're satisfied, they're ready to go, they can hit submit all and finish. And that's the point that it goes to the grade book. And that's another thing I love about an LMS. You don't have all that grading. I know most teachers, the bane of teaching is the big stack of stuff you have to grade. Well, if you teach a subject that you could have multiple choice questions, true, false questions, fill in the blank, where you put the answers in, those types of things, even drag and drop, that's something that it's an add-on right now that you do drag and drop questions. But in the, next, in the next version that's now out, Moodle 3, it actually has it part of core. So it's right there with you without even having to add it on. But drag and drop is great. It's a lot of fun. So for instance, if you're doing things like geography, you can have your map, and they drag and drop the labels to the right place. So there's a lot of question types you can add on. So if you've got a specialty course, for instance, if you teach chemistry, they have specialty questions that are specific to chemistry. So I like that even if you're in some of these what would usually be harder subjects to try to develop questions for, you've got help. So at this point, it goes to your grade book, or the student's grade book. Go on to the next one. And then because students can do multiple attempts, and this is, remember that inside of a single attempt, they can actually do multiple tries at questions by hitting that redo button if they go all the way through the hint levels. But students can also take multiple attempts if they want to if you set it up that way. So for instance, the very first student, I was trying to find something just to grab a screenshot of. I was so fortunate that the very first one I clicked, I had a student that did 12 attempts. <laughs> and that's partly because I really encourage it. When we get done with a module and they're ready now to study for the exam for that module, I am always telling my students, go back and retake those quizzes because that's your best way to tell if you're ready or not. If you have to get to hint level one or beyond, you're not ready for the exam because that one is that you only get one shot at the question. So I am very pleased to find that my students take my advice for the most part. And most of my students go, and they will do, multiple attempts. You can see this student, 12 attempts. Can you imagine your student doing 12, doing the homework 12 times? Um, now, if I had to hand grade that, I would be going, no, that's not such a good idea. But with computer scored, hey, it's not bad. And the students are getting their feedback right off the bat. So you can see I've got it. This one's slightly bold. This is actually showing the very first attempt the student did. And it was way back on the 13th of August. Um, it also gives information to the student and to the teacher. How long did they take on it? Now, I'm not surprised that they didn't pass. We, we, have a, we do mastery, so they have to get 80% to pass it. Um, but I'm not surprised they didn't pass because they only spent 8 minutes and 48 seconds. But this gives me the information as a teacher and I can say, you know, maybe part of the problem is you're rushing through this a little too quickly because this particular quiz should take you blah, blah, blah amount of time. So that gives you a lot of feedback about what you need. Plus, you can go and you can see exactly what the student answered on every try. 
So when you scroll down, whenever you're reviewing it as a teacher, and the students can see this too, whenever they go and they review their work, they can see what did they answer on their first try? What did they answer on their second try? What did they answer on their third try? And another thing I love about multi-take, when you've got question pools, you can set it up, randomize on that question pool, and every attempt is different. Because it wouldn't be very valuable to have multiple attempts if the questions were exactly the same in exactly the same order because they would just copy down their answers. Yeah. And, and so you want to have question pools with enough questions so that it's different every time that they go in there. So I thought you would love that, those multiple attempts. Um, now, there's also something that's pretty new. I'm not sure if it's 2.9 where it got started over. I think it's been around since 2.8. But you can have something called completion tracking. It's part of core. And that means that you can have it to where they cannot even see the next assignment until they meet your passing grade. We've chosen 80%, but if you want different, let's say as long as they get 70%, you want, you can, we'll let them pass forward. In chemistry, it's very concept on concept, so I like having it 80%, um, so they don't end up getting that snowballing on them. But you can set that, and it won't even, if you, want to have completion tracking and you want and you turn it on, they can't even see the next assignment until they pass it. So if you've got students that tend to just bull right through and they get C's, they get D's, no matter, I'm just going to go on to the next question because for me, speed is what's important. But you can help your student overcome that by turning on completion tracking and they can't move forward. They have to keep focusing on this one until they get it done. And um, and that's optional. You can decide for yourself if you want to turn that on or not. All right, now some things to help you, for instance, when you've got quizzes, you can have it to where you can have some of the questions to be hand scored if you want to. So let's say you hit a question, it would be just much better, better if it's an essay type of answer. They've got that question t typed in there. Or it might be a different thing than the quiz tool. You might use the assignment tools where they upload a file. Well, you want to know, OK, what do you, how do I f easily find those so that I can grade them? Well, you can get the add-on Grade Me block, and it's easy to get add-ons. Um, or you can use event monitoring. I'll talk about that in a second. The Grade Me block I really like, though. Um, but you can have it to where it, it's right in your sidebar, and only teachers see it. But it will tell you what's waiting to be graded. So I've, I've hidden the student's name here. But I can click on this to go to the student's profile. Or I can click on the little check mark in our theme. It's a check mark. And then that will take me right to their attempt. I can grade, if it's just a single essay question, I can just grade that essay question. Or if the whole thing, it, it can do assignments as well. Actually, this one is an assignment. This one's a lab, sorry. Um, if it's a lab or something like that, that's in, from the assignment tool. And you can do rubrics. They have a really nice rubric system. And all you have to do on, to score it is just click on the box in the rubric, and it adds up all the points for you and sends everything to the gradebook. It's, it's fantastic. Now, one little warning about the GradeMe block is if you have tons and tons and tons of students, you don't want to put that on your home page because it's, it's got to go through all those activities and all those students, most of you would never have that problem. But I'm grading for about 3,000 students. You can see why I like the quiz tool where it auto grades, <laughs> because there's no way I could keep up with that many students and hand grade. So I very, very much appreciate these tools. Yeah, 3,000 students, because we're, we're an open project. Students can sign up at will. All of our classes are free. So, and lots and lots of people know about us now. So. I have I have uh, I have two or three of just individual courses. Uh, uh, general science is close to a thousand, and what was the other one? Chemistry or biology? Another one that's almost a thousand students. Nine hundred and something in one, eight hundred and something in another, and that's not counting all the other courses. So lots and lots of students. I could never do this if I didn't have an LMS that had all these automated tools to help save me time. And then event monitoring is built into Moodle 2.9. I think it was introduced in 2.9. And with that one, you can set up custom events that you get notifications for. So for instance, for me, there are lots and lots of ways I could be notified. But if I wanted to get email every time somebody, every somebody, every time somebody turns in a homework assignment, that's an assignment tool. 
I can set up a custom notification that says send me email every time that happens. Um, and you could do that for the quizzes. And there's all kinds of different events that could be customized for every kind of activity. Uh, for instance, here's another really good one. Um, forum tools are built into Moodle. So if I've got a forum, usually you know, when we just get one or two posts per hour, that's usually a good sign that everything's going well. However, if you get a sudden burst that's unusual, like, like say more than 10 posts in an hour, you can send, set up an event monitoring rule and it will send you a message telling you, OK, it's triggered. There have been more than 10 posts in an hour. And you can customize how many posts you think it would be. And that helps you catch whenever there's a flame war that suddenly has gotten started among your students. I had that last year. Um, man, it, it was just, wow, if I could have had event monitoring last year when that happened, I could have caught that a lot faster. Yeah, a flame war, we had. It was some sort of, it's, it's sort of, I imagine all of you have experienced that, you know, the, the Justin Bieber versus I hate Justin Bieber fans kind of wars that can get started. It's like, oh, please, nobody bring up Justin Bieber, please. You know, and it was along that same ilk. It was I love versus I hate kind of got going. Um, and it was in a social forum. It wasn't in one of the academic forums. You can set that up to, to, to say, OK, this forum is for you to just be off topic chat, but this one's for staying on topic. And it was in one of my off topic ones. But it had, got, it had about a 24 hour lifespan before I realized, oh, there is something bad going on here. Right. So I, I love the things like event monitoring. And it will notify me. It'll send me emails saying, OK, more than 10 posts in an hour. Then I can go check on it, and maybe it's fine, but maybe it's not. But that help, helps you to catch up with, with potential problems. All right, now let's go ahead and another one. This is a new tool that we are working with adding in, and I absolutely love it. The design is to be able to help parents track their students, their students' progress. And it's an add-on to Moodle. And this is the interface that they would see. And students can see it. Teachers can see it. I even use it a lot just as a teacher because I, I just love the visual interface. But if a, a parent has got more than one student, there'll be a drop down. And then they can pick their children's names that they want to check on. And that just loads up their view. And then it tells how long ago since they last accessed. It lists all their courses. So here you can see chemistry. It's clicked on all this data is for chemistry shows all kinds of information that you want your parents to know. Now, it does require that your parents have a parent account and that they get connected to their students. So there's a little bit of administration involved with this, but so worth it. So parents can come in. You can see for this student, they come in. They say, oh, look, this student has missed three quizzes from topic one and one quiz from topic two. Well, mama's going to say, you are not going to have your iPhone until you get those caught up. So that puts the, puts the parents in charge of being able to know how is, how is my child missing stuff that my child should have. And then for us in chemistry, these would, be, these would be optional labs. So you could just let your parents know that those would be optionals when you see that icon. Anything that turns up with the red shows that they did not pass it. They did not meet their 80% minimum. So the parent can immediately see just really, really fast where the student is going to need to be fussed at. And they're going to need to make them sit down and study. So you've got that right there and available. They can also see if there's anything waiting to be graded. They can see how many were completed, how many were not completed, what's their score in that. They can click to go to grades, and they see the standard grade, back, grade book view if they like that better. And then there is under activity, it basically gives, it loads up all of the resources that are on the page, and it will show what date they last checked that on that activity. Um, so it's resource by resource type of thing on the page to show if they've looked at all the resources. So all of these are available. Really, really nice tool. We, we're we still tweaking a couple of things, but once we get done tweaking, it also, we can set it to where every certain period of days, I figure we'll probably do every seven days, it will send emails out to parents if their child has not logged in in that seven days or if they've not passed an exam. And it's all automated. 
So I, I don't have to go through and email parents myself in case they don't come in and they check here. Send the email right to them and based on whatever rules I set. So if I say I want every seven days for my parents to get an email and get notified that their child hasn't logged in or that their child didn't pass something that week. Or even if it's not even from that week, if there's just something at all that they've not met the 80% minimum, that they'll get a heads up. So this helps give the parents the tools that they need to know that their, parent, their, their child needs some intervention at home to get it. And I love this. It's called the Mentor-Mentees block that you can add. And it, as far as I know, it's brand new. Uh, they just have made that. So it may not be available for anything before 2.9 because it is new. Another thing that I really like is that you can look at your questions. There's tools in there for the teacher. You can go in and it will do statistics on all of the questions and all of the students' answers. And it will help you find questions that are not performing very well or that are just giving students a lot of trouble. Uh, for instance, this one right here, whenever I pulled this report so I can grab a screenshot, I said, oh, oh, look, I've got a couple of indicators. So I went to go look at this one, and it was one of those where choose more than one answers, and the students were missing that. They, were, they weren't catching on that it's not just one answer. They have to give more than one. So I, that, that helped flag me that, okay, let me just take that and let me make it in red, red text. There's more than one answer. And then now that question should perform better because the students are more likely to, to notice that they have to give more than one answer. So it's tools there to help you analyze your questions. How well are they performing on them? Maybe what questions it shows what the students know really well. For instance, define limiting reactant. 100% of the students got that answer correct. And, and then if you have, so you know, you don't have to keep hitting on that in your class time. But if you've got one like this one, 66.67%. Uh, well, I'm going to click on that and I'm going to see well, what topic is giving my students trouble. And then I know that I probably need to bring this up in class time and make sure that we've got a higher percentage of students being able to master these, those concepts. A lot of times it's just because it's just a hard question. It takes lots of stats, <laughs> lots of places for error. Um, also, you can track student participation, all kinds of reports. Like, for instance, I really have to watch my at your own pace students. I've got live class students. Pretty easy to keep them on pace because it's live class. They have to go at the speed of the rest of the class. But at your own pace students, they can go at whatever pace they want to. Um, they can go faster, slower, start anywhere they want, stop anywhere they want, et cetera. So I need a little extra help. I've got 406 at your own pace students enrolled in this particular course. The rest of them are live course live students. And I can see that only one, two, three, four, five, six, only six students have made it as far as where the live class is, module seven. So I can easily check these that are no, and then just drop a little note to those students that haven't yet gotten to seven, and just drop a little note to let them know. If you want to be done by the end of May and go at a kind of an even pace, you should be at about module seven right now. And that's easy. I just simply, it's a select all and then deselect these. And it gives me the tool for sending out a message. Very easy. Couple of button clicks and a little bit of text. And that's it. I'm done. I can let all the students that aren't yet where they should be at this point in the year to get done by the end of the year. Let them know you're a little behind. Need to watch out. All right. And, and you could also set up groups. So if you need a group of students that are allowed to go slower, you can, whatever groups you want to set up, and you can use those, that as a filter for your tools. Okay, now I'm to the end. I'm just going to give you a couple of resources. So um, we're going to have volunteer training, and I'm hoping and planning that we're going to have a really, really nice Moodle 2.9 series of classes way back with 1.9. Probably Peggy remembers this because she participated. I had a nine-week one day per week course on all of the tools in Moodle 1.9. And I'm hoping to do, have that all set up and ready to go this summer. So if you feel like, hey, I'd really like to learn about 2.9, we should have that up and running. You could take that course in the summertime. And then also, for those, even those of you that do not have an LMS, we have all kinds of resources that we make publicly available. And that is, let me get that link here. 
Um, and you can even just download download the zip file and just put it on a computer inside your class. You don't even have to have internet access. They're mostly Captivate files. Um, you will want, uh, where did I put my link? Well, let me just do this one and I'll add it. It might be faster. Virtual homeschool group files. Okay, that's the link right there that will take you to, it's just a, just a very dull directory as far as, you know, nothing pretty, but it's just a directory of files. So, for instance, if you go into the math directory, you'll see that it's got all kinds of topic areas that you would expect to see in math. But if you go down far enough, you'll see zip files, and you can actually play our interactive lessons. So if you find some of those interactive lessons to be useful, go ahead. Those interactive lessons are ones that primarily I've built. There's some, a few other volunteers that have, but they're copyright friendly. I've got all of my stuff is set to uh, um, uh, CC BY, so just credit me. You can use it. And if you do use Captivate, I also have Captivate, the raw Captivate files. If you want to modify it for your own lesson, just open up and Captivate and make the modifications. You can even I've even got it, most of those scripted. You can actually change it over so it's got your voice. Just read the script. And if you've got Captivate. So tons and tons, literally in the math section alone, there's over 300 Captivate lessons. And in science, there's quite a lot too. So, and I've, I've always, always tried to make these available, even when we're on 1.9. So those are all there. And then, oops, I don't want to go forward yet because I have a couple more resources. Let me go back. Um, a couple more resources. Um, if you have never used Moodle and you just want to go ahead and get started, but your school, maybe they don't host the Moodle for you, you can download it and load it onto your local machine. You can't use it with your students, but if you just want to use it to build courses just to get used to it, completely free, all of Moodle is free. Uh, download it. You can load it onto your machine and start building courses right away. If you would like to play around with the demo site, let me get that link for you here. And it's probably posted in the live binder, but I'll at least point it out now. OK, there you go. Peggy's keeping up with me. Thank you, Peggy. Um, also, that I had mentioned that Moodle now officially hosts their own place for our teachers to go to for free. So if you want to have a course, go to Moodle Cloud. Let me get this link for you. OK, good. Peggy's always so good to keep up. I take that link, and you can have up to 50 users. Probably you count as one, so it would be 49 students. You'll get 200 megabyte disk space. And you'll get just their vanilla core theme and the core plugins that are pretty normal. So you might not be able to get some of the fancy plugins. They, they try to keep it as simple for them as possible since they're giving it to you for free. Um, and then maybe you get started with that and you love it. You can use that one with your students. Send your students to that your, your course page in that Moodle Cloud one. Um, and you can actually start using it. And then if you want to move up to where you can actually have custom plugins and stuff, you can, there's a lot of Moodle partners where for a reasonable fee, they will host your Moodle. Um, and then uh, you can also get course resources. So if you say, well, I would like to do this, but man, starting out with building my own course, I don't know. You can get free downloadable courses. If you go to that one, that is the Moodle's official location where people that want to share their courses, they, they put it in that one. You can sort and find the courses that you want. You can download the course, install it in your own Moodle, and voila, you've got a course ready to go. Um, also, another really good one is this one, Open High School. They also share their courses. You just download them and put them in your Moodle. And that's this one. And then, yeah, if you go to teachers, paid teachers, there's a lot of teachers that use Moodle that they sell individual course resources or full-scale Moodles. Um, and then uh, you can try NROC. We did NROC for a year. This would be more not really for an individual teacher, but more for a school district. But NROC has got some algebra courses and things like that that they've got. Very, very nice. We use them for a semester or so. Uh, really, really, really nice resources. Um, but a little bit more on the level of what a school district could get because it does cost money. You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't be able to get that just as a teacher probably unless they, they've changed their offering a little bit. But a very, very high polish level course with super nice resources. 
So there's a bunch there. And if you do a little internet research, you, you can probably find more of where people are sharing whole courses or resources that you could put in your course. So it's really pretty easy to get started with Moodle um, and not have to spend any money if you don't want to. Um, it just depends on what your needs are. So if you've got a small class, you just want one or two classes, hey, you've got, you've got all kinds of free options out there. And anything that costs more than that is because somebody's server hosting it for you. And of course, your school can get it. Tell your IT department, hey, I want Moodle. And they can set you up with a Moodle. You could even set it up in your own class if you want to. You just set up a computer, do that local type of thing where you can download it, and then they can work right off of that Moodle in your classroom. They won't be able to log in from home, more than likely, unless you sweet talk your IT department into, into setting something up. But you can have it to where, just inside your classroom, they can sit down at the computer and access your course and do stuff right there in your computer, on, on the computer in the room. OK, and that's wrapping it up, because I dare not go any longer than this. As it is, I'm not given much time for a wrap up. So I will stay after, if, if everyone doesn't mind, I'll stay after and answer any questions. We'll just go right ahead and, and uh, do our wrap up quickly. And if you have any further questions, please type them in the chat. And uh, Tammy will answer those for you. Thank you so much, Tammy, for this fantastic overview and guided tour through Moodle 2.9. I sure have learned a lot of new things and can't wait to go in and explore more on some of those links you've shared with us. We want to let everyone know that we have a fabulous show coming up next week. So many of you have said, where do you get funding support for doing these kinds of classroom projects um, that may or may not in incorporate technology? Daisha Jones is like the, the grant writing queen. And she is going to join us next weekend to share some awesome tips and links and resources about grant writing and funding sources. And then the following week on January 13th, just remember, we won't have a show that day because there are two fabulous things going on that day. The Student Technology Conference, which is an entire conference presented by students for students. And that's all day on the 30th from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's totally free. And then also the Educon conference in Philly. That is a face-to-face -face conference, but they stream events all day long. And it's always so valuable. So I hope that you'll be able to take advantage of that too. So Lori, go ahead and finish up these final slides, and we'll see if there are any more questions. All right, Peggy. Again, thank you, Tani, for the presentation today. Uh, le the Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkett on Slatist. He's gathered together all his PD resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar series. You can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room to host an event, and it's free as long as you make that event public. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link. The form is also in the live binder. We have a featured teacher each month. And you can also nominate yourself for this. As you exit the session, the survey should open up in your browser. You can also take the, the direct link or the link in the chat. There's also a tab in the live binder for it, again, in that resources section. As you take the survey at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate. It will print out with your name here in the uh, area where it says name on this one. And please make sure it's a personal email address rather than a school email address when you make that request because schools tend to block this from getting to you. The archives and are also in a video collection and audio collection in iTunes U. And I know there's a, a new link for the iTunes U direct access. The archives also are available by RSS feed or the full recording links in the Classroom 2.0 Live website. 
Special thanks again to Tammy Moore, our special guest for today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thank you so much for coming.